White flies are usually associated with greenhouse and household plants, but there are many species that can live outside. In fact, many of the traditional greenhouse pests can end up in the landscape through infested bedding plants. These can cause major problems during the summer, but they are killed when freezing temperatures arrive. Also, many of these tropical species can thrive well in our southern states where winter temperatures rarely get below freezing. Because the next three modules concentrate on the large number of scale insects, I plan to introduce the general life cycle that all scales follow in some form. White flies have scale-like life cycles in the nymphal stage. The spindle-shaped eggs are attached to suitable host foliage by adults. Usually the youngest foliage is selected for egg laying. After a few days the eggs hatch into the first instar nymph which is called a crawler. The crawler has functional legs, short antennae, and tiny eye spots. When a suitable location on the leaf has been found, the crawler inserts its stylets into the phloem tubes and begins to feed and, after a few days, molts into the second instar nymph, which is now called a scale. This scale stage no longer has functioning legs. The scale stage molts one more time, which is the third instar nymph, and continues to feed and grow. After finishing its growth, the scale form molts into the fourth instar nymph, which is now called a pupa. The pupa is usually distinctly different in form, and pupal forms are often used to identify whitefly species. The pupa doesn't feed and serves as a transformation stage. A few days later, the winged adults, both males and females, emerge, expand their wings, and are capable of feeding, walking, and flying. There are several white fly species that are found around the world, having been transported by the worldwide floriculture and ornamental plant industries. The greenhouse white fly has been the oldest white fly pest. But in the 1990s, a white fly that was very similar to the greenhouse white fly appeared, and this pest was really difficult to manage with the usual white fly insecticides. Because of some taxonomic issues, this one is often called the sweet potato or silver leaf white fly. There are two biotypes of this white fly that exhibit differing resistance to several categories of insecticides. Both the greenhouse and the sweet potato, silver leaf white flies, attack a wide range of plants. Both do best in greenhouse grown vegetables and annual flowers. Both can also get transported into home landscapes on garden vegetable plants as well as annual flowers. The banded wing white fly seems to prefer woody plants and this species can establish in landscapes and survive where temperatures don't get excessively cold during the winter months. We'll use the greenhouse white fly as our first example of a white fly. As previously stated, this one can arrive in the landscapes or in the home on infested plants. Inside the home, it can be a pest that continues as long as the household plant is kept alive. Outside, the greenhouse white fly can only live during the summer warm months as all instars can't withstand freezing temperatures. Most species of white flies are copious honeydew producers, and this may be one reason why the nymphs settle on leaf undersurfaces. This way, the honeydew will drop away from their bodies onto the upper surfaces of the foliage below. This pest can build up incredibly large populations on plant leaves, with the result being early leaf yellowing and dropping. As you can see in this ornamental mint leaf, all stages can occur on a leaf but newly emerged adults prefer to concentrate their eggs on young foliage. The shape and form of the whitefly pupa is often good for helping identify whitefly species. Notice that the greenhouse whitefly pupa is raised up, kind of like a pancake placed on a hot griddle. It also has sets of long glassy bristles arising from the tops and sides of the exoskeleton. These are actually waxy spines and the raised exoskeleton plus the glassy spines are diagnostic. The greenhouse whitefly adult also holds its wings flattened down along the outer edge. The silverleaf whitefly adults hold their wings more to the side of the body, almost wrapping around the abdomen. 
The white on white fly wings is actually a coating of waxy dust. This can be rubbed off, but the insects have wax glands that continue to replace this dusting. The waxy coating helps keep the white flies from getting stuck in spider webbing, sticky plant spines, and honeydew deposits. Here are some excellent close-up images from the University of California that shows the differences between the greenhouse and the sweet potato silverleaf white fly adults and pupae. As previously stated, the greenhouse white fly pupae have conspicuous glassy spines that remain even after the adult has emerged from the pupa. The sweet potato white fly pupa swells up a bit but remains rounded on the edges and is without spines. Notice that the sweet potato white fly adult appears to have its wings wrapped around the body and the body color is a bit more yellow. Each white fly develops at different rates depending on ambient temperature, humidity, and host. In many cases, this is not overly important, but when using short residual, contact insecticides, or biological controls, these different rates of development can be extremely important in managing these pests. In short, white fly pupae are often unaffected by contact insecticides, so at cooler temperatures, reapplications may be needed until all the pupae have emerged. Likewise, some parasitoids slow their development more than the white flies at lower temperatures. On the other hand, other parasitoid species develop faster than the white flies at these lower temperatures. So selecting the right species and strain geared to the growing temperature is essential for success. The banded wing white fly is another fairly common species that can be found in greenhouses, but it is more common in anterior scapes and conservatories that keep woody perennial plants. This one can also occur outside where the winter temperatures rarely get below freezing. The adults are easily diagnosed as they have a zigzag band of dark gray that, that runs across the middle of the forewings. The third instar nymphs and pupae are also distinctive in that they have a white margin along the sides. The mulberry whitefly is a relatively common species that can occur on a wide range of deciduous tree leaves. It is a hardy species that is able to withstand freezing winter temperatures. It is often found on mulberry as well as hackberry, sweet gum, dogwood, and maple. It rarely reaches high populations as it is readily attacked by several predators and parasitoids. The third instar nymphs and pupae develop an unusual fringe of white wax which is easily seen with the unaided eye. The adults look a bit like the banded wing white fly, but they have two lighter zigzag bands across the wings. Infested trees overhanging sidewalks and driveways can be fouled with honeydew. The Rugos spiraling white fly is generally just called the spiraling white fly. It is one of the more recent invasive species that is found in Florida, but it seems to be spreading quite rapidly. It appears to have come from the Caribbean area and can attack a wide range of landscape plants, but it seems to prefer woody trees and shrubs. It gets its name from the unusual egg-laying habits of the female. She will walk in a spiral depositing eggs with waxy threads covering them. The nymphs often cluster side by side along a leaf vein. The nymphs are copious producers of waxy threads that often cover them. The adults are one of the larger species of white flies. These waxy threads and honeydew can foul sidewalks and get into swimming pools where plants are overhanging the pools. It takes about 30 days to complete its life cycle in the summer weather conditions. There are quite a few other species of white flies that can occur in landscapes, but most are located in warmer climates. The palm white fly is a common species in the Gulf states and Southern California. Its pupae also have a fringe of white wax that is similar to the mulberry white fly pupa, but mulberry white flies don't normally get on palms. The adults are small with pale yellow bodies. The giant white fly is also found only in Florida and Southern California. 
It is an impressive white fly that can attack a wide range of plants. Like the spiraling white fly, the giant white fly produces considerable waxy threads as nymphs and pupae. These threads can completely envelop leaves and plants, making them look like they've been attacked by some kind of strange fungus. White flies in greenhouses and interior scapes are easily detected by using yellow sticky cards. These are cheap and easily obtainable from greenhouse supply companies. However, bright yellow plastic sheets can be cut into 4 by 4 inch squares and sprayed with cooking oil. Only a thin coating is needed. The cards are clipped onto sticks or hung from rafters at the growing level of the current crop of plants. The card should be inspected on a regular basis, that is several times per week. If white fly detections are made, nearby plants need to be carefully inspected to locate where the white flies have become established and to determine the species that is present. For landscapes, simple visual inspections of the plants is all that is required. Simply tap the upper leaves of a plant or jiggle the entire plant while looking for any tiny white insect that may take off. Using parasitoids for control of white flies has been very successful and is regularly done in European glasshouse vegetable production. In these cases, the harvested vegetables are unaffected aesthetically, though the plants may look discolored and, the, and insect infested. For this reason, parasites and predators are rarely used in North America where the entire plant will be sold and the consumer is expecting pest-free plants. There are several schemes for using Encarsia, a common parasitoid wasp. Parasitized whitefly pupae can be purchased and these are placed around a greenhouse room where whiteflies have been detected. In other cases, a stock of the Encarsia are maintained on banker plants. That is, plants that are not being grown for sale but kept to maintain whitefly and parasitoid populations. When the greenhouse crop is moved on, the baker plants remain to maintain the parasitoids. In landscapes, general predators like lacewing larvae, lady beetle adults and larvae, and other parasitic wasps do well to manage most of the native whitefly species. In some states where invasive whiteflies have been introduced, new parasitoids are often released to combat these whiteflies. Our next three modules will cover the large group of hemipterous insects collectively known as scales. Most of you probably already know of mealybugs, soft scales, and armored scales, but we will learn that there are many more families than these. What is interesting to me is that all these insects use the same general life cycle template. Most lay eggs, but there are species that are ovoviviparous. When the eggs hatch or the first instar nymph is born, it is called a crawler. The task of this crawler is to find a suitable place to insert its stylets to begin feeding. Those that feed on phloem liquids produce abundant honeydew, and those that feed on cell contents don't produce honeydew, but they don't produce tar spots either. After the crawler has fed and developed, it molts into the second instar nymph. This nymph can remain mobile or can lose the function of its legs and become sessile. In bisexual species of scales, males undergo an extra molt into a non-feeding nymph stage that is called a pupa. Inside this pupa, the mobile adult males are formed. These males have one pair of wings and non-functioning mouth parts. Their only task is to find a new female and mate. If the nymph is a female, it will molt only once more into a nymph-like adult. This female can continue to feed, and depending on the species, the female may be sessile or mobile, oviparous or ovoviviparous. The often untold story about the general scale life cycle is that some of the stages can go into dormancy and not be feeding when a systemic insecticide is applied. Just like what we saw with some of the adelgids, there can be times in the life cycle of scales that they are really difficult to control. 
For most scales, the crawler has to eat, and this is often the stage that is most commonly referred to when using insecticides for control. Depending on the scale species, many second instar nymphs may enter an estivation or hibernation period when it isn't feeding. During that time, even systemic insecticides will be ineffective. Likewise, the male pupian adults are not good targets for control as they don't feed. And finally, many scales have females that can overwinter and these may enter a diapause where they are not feeding and only resume feeding the following spring. <laughs>